Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming. It's so nice to see uh, such a wonderful turnout on a Sunday morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Uh, this is the third webinar of a series of webinars that Varta Trust organized during the Pride Month. And I know it's been a bit of a spillover into July. It couldn't be helped. We are calling this webinar Realizing Our Rights, Making Laws Work. Because right now, as we stand in India, there are uh, legal changes that have been happening over the last several years. But how much has it actually impacted things at the ground level? For this, we have brought together some people from different walks of life and from dif uh, different parts of the gender and sexuality spectrum as well. Um, we have with us the fantastic Dr. Aksa Sheikh, who is one of India's first transgender doctors, and she's also an associate professor of community medicine and a nodal officer for the COVID vaccination center at the Hamdad Institute of Medical Sciences and Research at Jamia Hamdad in Delhi. We have with us Bishwa Bhusan Patanayak. Bishwa is a social worker and is uh, an assistant director for the Solidarity and Action Against the HIV Infection in India office in uh, Bhuvaneshwar and currently oversees their work with LGBT uh, IQ plus individuals on community capacity building, policy analysis, etc. We have with us Deet Dodam, who is um, uh, an Intersex Asia Fellow 2020, 2021, and is also a member of the Intersex Human Rights India. We have with us Saptashi Mandal, who is an uh, Associate Professor at the Jindal Global Law School in Sonipat, and his teaching and research spans family law, disability, mental health law, sexual violence, and the sociology of law. And last but not least uh, is Suresh Sanab. Suresh is a research consultant with the Center for Health Equity, Law and Policy, or C Help as we know it, where he works on legal policy concerns on health, HIV, AIDS, and LGBTQI plus communities through research, advocacy, and litigation. Now, uh, with that, I would like uh, to start with my first concern with the way things have been going during COVID and and, uh, and this is a question for all of you, but I would like to get a comment from each of you if that's possible. We have the Transgender Persons Protection of Rights Act 2019 uh, that came about and it is supposed to have enhanced the lives of queer people. But as we see in India today, uh, even just visibility versus tolerance versus acceptance is such a challenge. How do we go about uh, uh, looking at a, a piece of legislation in a society where just basic visibility is still a challenge? Uh, so I would like to uh, call on Aksa first. Aksa, if you would mind commenting on it. Yeah, thanks, Devyoti, and um, so nice to be uh, in the company of uh, so many friends and uh, uh, activists. Um, you, know, you, you did uh, mention about the trans community, and one needs to understand that when we speak about the trans community, it's not a block. Um, there's so much diversity within the trans community um, in terms of people from socio-ethnic groups like Hijra, Kinnar, and Aravani communities. And on one side, you also have the trans men and non-binary persons who are often invisibilized. And um, sadly, the intersex persons are also now legally clubbed um, with the trans persons under the act. Um, and uh, most of us don't even know one intersex person in our lives, you know. Uh, so that is the level of invisibilization or hypervisibilization that is present of the trans community um, in the society. When it comes to um, tolerance, um, uh, which you talked about, I mean, socioculturally, there has been a tolerance of the uh, Hijra and the Kinder community um, because they're not your family members. The tolerance, uh, you know, is really tested when one of your family members comes out and says that, hey, I identify as a trans or non-binary person. Now, accept me or at least tolerate me. You know, and when it comes to that, unfortunately, things are not great. Um, 
in the younger trans folks we have seen the parental acceptance increase but uh, you know still still there's a long way to go uh, now, when it comes to the uh, Trans Act, unfortunately, that has become the focus because of the way it is presented as a landmark legislation by our government. But I think a, a more important uh, milestone in the journey of trans rights has been the NALSA versus the Union of India judgment, um, which provided more rights as compared to the Trans Act, which was more rooted into self identification. Um, and uh, not medicalizing transness or, uh, uh, you know, giving a lot of importance to surgeries or certification. Unfortunately, uh, the Trans Act, in spite of so much resistance from within the community, is now a reality of our lives and we are governed by it. And um, as a lot of us know, there are problematic areas in it. One is it talks about some kind of medical intervention to change our gender into the binaries of male or female. Uh, it also um, diminishes the quantum of punishment that a person would get for abuse of a transgender person. Um, it also gives a lot of power to the magistrates to determine or to do the gatekeeping for the persons uh, who want to change their gender. It places families at the center of guardianship of a trans person. It does not recognize the Hijra Gharana system. So there are so many problematic areas and um, rightly there are challenges in the courts of law against uh, this piece of legislation and it will be interesting to see how that unfolds. But what is also important is that we should not be lost in uh, you know, just fighting the trans act. There have been a lot of progressive developments in the past uh, few years in terms of um, high court taking into cognizance the right of the trans persons, whether it is in terms of marriage, uh, whether it is in terms of adoption, uh, getting a job in police forces, pensions, um, and uh, even when it comes to the medical curriculum and the right to a transphobic, uh, you know, trans affirmative curriculum, uh, judgments against convergent therapy. So I think it's also important to leverage, uh, you know, the courts and the judgments which are happening, um, you know, to uh, build upon the trans rights, which may not be provided to us by the transgender persons protection of rights. Also, one point which I want to highlight um, uh, is that uh, the certification is the backbone of the empowerment schemes of the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. And if you look at the last census count of trans persons in India or the other gender category in India, which was 4.87 lakhs uh, 11 years back, which we know is an undercount. Um, if you look at the number of people who have gotten a trans ID card so far, it's less than 10,000. It's abysmally low. And what this means, uh, and this is important to understand, is that the scholarships and other benefits of, for example, surgery, insurance and all, will only be limited to these 10,000 persons. And though the Act clearly says that people who have undergone a name and gender change before the desert notification came into place, um, you know, don't have to undergo the process again. When it comes to the on-ground reality, if I want to get a you know, scholarship today, I have to repeat those processes again. So um, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. But one point which I want to highlight is that the Trans Act is not the only thing. We need to also leverage the various courts and their judgments. Yeah. Thank you so much, Aksa. Uh, yes, absolutely. In fact, the ground level reality is about uh, people being able to access uh, uh, any scholarships, uh, uh, trans people or any person who identifies within the ambit of the act or not the NASA judgment, being able to access uh, any of the empowerment schemes has been abysmally low as well, primarily because of the barriers that we see everywhere. Which uh, brings me to Bishwa. Bishwa, uh, given the kind of work that you've been doing in Orissa and in the Northeastern states, 
what sort of action have you seen at the ground level in order to remove certain barriers when it comes to uh, more inclusion of people uh, whose ID cards have been changed, but uh, they are find, still finding it difficult to access empowerment schemes? Yeah. Thank you, Dev, Dev Jyoti, and thank you, uh, Bartha Trust, for having me here. So, yeah, so what Aksa was uh, telling, so I'll add on to that. So from our experience, um, the Trans Act, uh, even though like uh, we have been working in uh, Odisha, uh, other Northeastern states like Manipur, Meghalaya, Nagaland, also we are working with uh, communities in uh, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Kerala. So, so what we have seen is um, there has been, there, there is significant, you know, intervention needed in terms of bringing the literacy on uh, trans act. So the community members on the ground are, as uh, Aksa was pointing out, there are only 10,000 some odd numbers that have been registered as of now. So because the, uh, like the, the about the trans act, what it, uh, like uh, the benefits of the, you know, uh, uh, under the trans act and all those stuffs are not yet reached to the community members. That's one. The second part is when we are saying that you, uh, registered in a national portal, it has its advantage, uh, I know, but think of a community member who is staying in a rural part of a state, that person doesn't have access to smartphone, even doesn't have access to any feature phone. So you need to get a OTP, you need to register with your email ID and, you know, uh, then only you'll be able to apply with, you know, uh, with your scan, your digital signature, with your photographs and all. So you need some community group, some CSS to work with you. So it's not self-enabled. See, so there are some, uh, like there are many changes that we need to do when, it, when we talk about the implementation of the act, because somewhere in the act also, it was written that the uh, state government will work out possible mode of, you know, uh, uh, strategies, like how this can be rolled out in their own states. But uh, I think, the state government need to think depending on the you know sociocultural environment of that particular state that is not there still we are dependent on the national portal which has its own, own challenges then still now also there are uh, at one point of time dr aksa was telling you know about conversion therapy um, also uh, about uh, the uh, medical intervention part so recently i was interacting with one uh, collector and district magistrate and he was referring to a document which was the draft version of the transgender protection of uh, like transgender uh, rules 2020, uh, 20, uh, 2020 and there was written it was uh, you know you need psychologist certificate so the the final version which was you know published in the gazette doesn't have anything like that and the district magistrate has this kind of understanding meaning we have not reached out to the people those are really matter to us because they are the a gatekeeper, they are going to issue the cards and this kind of, uh, and the, I'm talking about a trans person from a Balangi district, let's say the Western part of the Odisha, who is staying in a rural part of the, uh, the state, that person do not, doesn't know anything about it, how that person will apply, how that person will go and approach the uh, district magistrate about it. So all this medical intervention part is not being analyzed properly, not being communicated properly. And it's just, it is kept as a definition. So the government needs to work on it. The and also uh, it's our role of CSOs and uh, CBOs that we need to work with government. So these are two challenges. Also, in many places we have seen, though the applications are going up, the pendency rate are also in that way. So if you see the act, the trans ID card should be issued within 30 days. But in many places you will see those are continued to be pending. A recent case in Nagaland, we have helped few people in uh, applying the trans act, is the transgender ID card, and uh, they are not clear how they will issue that. So within the department, they have referred that to uh, uh, NIC National Information Center of that uh, like district, and then they are just uh, you know uh, struggling around that. So somewhere the Ministry of Social Justice just. Uh, we saw in a couple of last in a couple of months, they were doing uh, some regional consultations, but they need to sit with states. They need to have state specific strategies, what to do. Yes, Devdhuti, thank you. 
Thank you, Vishwa, for that. Yes, uh, state-specific strategies are highly required, uh, but the problem is, as you very correctly mentioned, uh, there's been such a, a differentiation in the way uh, things have been applied and things have been carried forward that in some spaces uh, we see that certain states have been doing much better when it comes to uh, uh, giving out ID cards and like, you know, like, uh, stopping the queue in a way, the gatekeeping is being done slightly better, but the misunderstandings that are there around the identities that come under the trans umbrella, the queer umbrella in a way, um, uh, tend to become a huge barrier in the way people within the queer community are approached, which actually brings me to Deet. Deet as a person, uh, uh, as an intersex person, given that uh, uh, there are so many um, misnomers around intersexuality within the trans community, uh, within the larger queer community as well. There's, uh, there are a lot of misunderstandings around it. How has your experience been, your personal as well as your professional experience, uh, being given that you've been affiliated with Intersex Asia, you're also part of the Intersex Human Rights Institute. How has your experience been when it, has, uh, when it comes to uh, a greater acceptance or like at least tolerance uh, of the intersex community? Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, even uh, even till today, there is a low rate of you know being aware about intersex variations. Even people who are working for intersex rights, they are at some point of time they are being confused because there are many variations of intersex, and there are certain cases where a person cannot be identified as an intersex. You know. Just that they have, uh, let's say, for, for example, a baby child has the uh, uh, internal and external physical anatomy that is um, that is to be present in a male child. But that child, due to some uh, disability, his testis has not been uh, descended properly, or that his penis is little, uh, comparatively small than the normal child. So the it, let's say the doctor uh, mistakenly assigned that child as female. Then when that child grow up, when that child reaches puberty, then the changes will be different. You know, it will it won't be the changes that is required that we can see in a female child, but that of a male. And so the child may go into uh, many phases of you know mentally, physically might be confused about his identity, but later on when, after puberty, after he hits puberty, when he consulted doctors and all, he, he might find out that, you know, he was born male, but because of some disorder in his sex development, he was assigned female at birth. So that child, we can consider that child as a transit. And so uh, in India, we don't have that specific um, laws where this, mistakenly assigned female at birth child can be legally changed to male after surgery or before surgery because that child was naturally born as a male, but due to some disorder, he was assigned female at birth. These cases are also there, and there are also other cases of intersex where a child is born partly as male, you know, have partly male uh, characteristics and partly female characteristics. So, we don't know whether this in uh, this community members that we call as intersex and people who are you know uh, the in medical term they are referred to as dsds disorders in sex development uh, people so we don't know whether they are going to be included in this transgender act of 2019 or do we need a special um, spe special policy for them you know, they don't, they not only need medical attention, but they need legal attention because mistakenly they can be assigned any gen, any sex identity at birth. And when they grow up, they may not, they may not be matching with the sex assigned at birth. So these cases do arise. And in Transgender Act of 2019, it only mentioned the word intersex and nothing much more. So I think it is high time that the, um, that the government, the concerned government takes initiative and 
regarding the transgender act 2019 it, it is mentioned that the appropriate government the appropriate government but we can find that you know the government is not taking any sense, uh, initiative in sensitizing or advocating about transgender rights because of lack of awareness of the transgender act of 2019 we can see many dysfunctioning of the uh, of various uh, concerned okay, institutions clear. regarding the transgender of 2019 and yes we have heard from uh, aksa uh, from biswa about the lack of uh, about the lack of you know initiative by the government this is all because of the lack of awareness and you know the lack of initiation that the government needs to take regarding transgender and uh, I think it is high time that we highlight about the uh, needs of such uh, policies and regulations about intersex and DSTs community also. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deet. I think one thing that carries on coming up regularly uh, throughout our discussions in respect of when they are is the medicalized case of uh, over the uh, uh, gender non-binary body. Uh, whether the person identifies as trans or intersex or GNB, there's this constant quagmire that they are pushed into uh, 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 through a very medicalized process and which in turn uh, influences the way the legal system approaches their bodies as well. Uh, the, hum the human aspect of it is often removed and put in the uh, background. Now, with that, um, uh, Saptashi, over to you. Um, when it comes to uh, looking at a gamut of cases uh, where you have uh, extremely progressive uh, uh, judgments being passed by state high court, say for instance, the Tamil Nadu High Court was one of the first courts, if I recall correctly, to uh, stop uh, 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 surgeries on intersex infants. Uh, and then you have like various such judgments coming about. How do you create a, 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 a space where the intersections of society are brought together through these judgments? And when you're uh, teaching the younger cohort of people, like students who are coming out into the world and, you know, all very doe-eyed that we are going to save the world, you know, like how we all did at some point of time all as human rights lawyers. Um, and this also goes for Suraj in a way, because, of course, Suraj is a, a, a human rights lawyer and a practitioner. Uh, how do you marry the two you know like the ground level reality versus the theories that are coming about constantly and we seem to live in this little legal lava land that we look at as progressive on some level but in actuality it is only the bunch of us some of us on on this platform who actually managed to benefit from it over to you all right thanks Peter. um you asked me about um, the gap between theory and the ground realities. Uh, to talk about ground realities, I make it a point to not exceptionalize the case of LGBT rights, right? Uh, so for example, let, let, let's take the, the, the title of today's event, Making Laws Work. Um, but laws don't work for most people in this country, right? And while listening to the previous presentations, I was thinking about the uh, I was thinking about similar conversations that we have had on the rights of persons with disabilities act 2016 and they are very same right so it, it, it's it's uh, it's important to get out of the habit uh, of uh, the decriminalization campaign where we kind of presume that laws work for everyone but it does not work for us so everyone has a different set of experiences with the police, but only it's only us queer people who have, you know, who, who, who face stigma and who, whose rights are violated and so on and so forth. Uh, so, so I think we need to sort of end that tendency to exceptionalize, and that should be the starting point of any analysis. Uh, and, and, and precisely that's what I try to do in uh, my classrooms. Uh, rather than focusing on one particular law or one particular uh, 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 constituency that's affected, you know, uh, uh, rather than sort of foregrounding the experiences of one particular constituency, I think it's important to talk about the larger system, the, the, the system in general, 
uh, right? Uh, uh, it, it's a dysfunctional system. So for example, again, I'll go back to the decriminalization campaign as a template, as an example. Uh, the issue was a criminal law, right? The issues that we were talking about were uh, 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 abuse by the police, abuse of the law by the police. And yet that campaign never uh, join hands with, say, the campaign against police atrocities, the campaign against uh, uh, torture, right? Uh, uh, but if you if you uh, uh, looked at, I mean, uh, it, it it always sort of I always wonder why um, the LGBT movement never sort of join hands with the sex workers movement on this issue because the experiences are experiences have always been very same, very similar. Uh, you know, with respect to the police. Uh, uh, and, and I think here also, uh, the problems that afflict the distribution of welfare benefits on the Trans Act are similar to the problems that afflict the, you know, similar issues under the uh, uh, RPD Act. Uh, they're similar to uh, 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 the problems under the Narega and so on and so forth. So it, it, it's probably, so, so okay. I, I, I try to emphasize that in, in my in my teaching and in my analysis to not exceptionalize. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and maybe Suraj can uh, uh, add more from his experience. And uh, Suraj, before you start adding to that, I just want to add to what Saptarshi <laughs> said. Um, uh, the thing is like, you know, uh, when we're talking about larger contexts and all, it, it is easier to perhaps create a framework, but when it comes to actually looking at how pragmatic it is to you know uh, encompass whole hosts of issues together and look at it from a comparative angle when we're trying to create changes sometimes that creates a lot of difficulties uh, so we land up focusing on particular constituencies just so that we can get some leeway in how has that also impacted your work over to you suraj so i think um... I mean, something that I've been thinking recently is, uh, you know, because there are marriage equality petitions pending before courts and people are, of course, they're talking also beyond marriage and looking at legal recognition of different forms of uh, kinship networks that queer trans people choose to make. But of late, what I've been thinking also is, uh, you know, you still live in the time when uh, honor killings and uh, violence against intercaste couples make headlines and more intensified every day. Um, and those things, uh, those relationships are legally recognized under Indian law for uh, uh, as long as uh, the country has been independent. So I'm, I keep thinking about how legal recognition is going to uh, change uh, those material realities for queer trans intersex people and I seem to keep thinking that I mean we need to look at and learn from experiences of the anti-caste movement uh, other religious minorities and uh, I mean apart from uh, um, you know advocating for a progressive social economic rights agenda uh, this aspect of uh, safety, security, and protection of life and liberty at the minimum, I feel uh, we need to look at and look, partner with anti-caste uh, minority religious movements to learn and partner with them. Thank you, Suraj. Uh, th this has uh, been a burning issue across the board i actually uh heard very recently like you know the the entire thing of uh, uh how uh, different sorts of pressures are put on different groups irrespective of uh, because of the current political scenario in india as well you know the uh, kind of uh, atrocities that are being carried out across the board um uh, where you know um, muslim uh, domestic workers have been threatened in households which were uh, uh, you know apparently very liberal so they're allowing muslim domestic workers to come in, in 
into a caste Hindu household, but the moment they open their mouths about anything, anything that's happening in their slums, in their dwellings, or in the areas that they live in, and which is politically affiliated, uh, they are told that if you speak like this, then we will disallow you or your brethren from entering our building. So you're hitting at the lowest common people, you know, like, and hitting at their stomachs. And obviously, they're not going to, you know, speak up. And when it comes to, uh, and we have to look at uh, queer rights in India within that larger framework, for sure, uh, especially because like we are constantly living in a world of intersectionalities, we cannot isolate any one aspect, which uh, actually brings me back to AXA. AXA, uh, you have also worked with people with disabilities. Uh, and how do you uh, see a marriage between uh, the movements which, uh, of uh, you know, around trans people, around LGBT rights, around people with disabilities shaping up in India, particularly, as a person who is not just a, a doctor, but also a researcher? Over to you. Yeah, so some excellent points, uh, you know, to um, think about and, uh, um, you know, when you talk about marrying this and this, that's problematic. <laughs> because not many of us uh, want to get into these marriages. Anyways, so, um, you know, um, taking cue from what uh, Saptarshi mentioned, you know, about various marginalized communities showing solidarity with each of them. Uh, learning from each other's movements and taking that, you know, further um, in their own fights for their rights. And that's absolutely essential uh, because when it comes to how the state, uh, you know, takes away the rights of the marginalized communities, uh, it's, it's brutal to all, whether it's persons with disability, whether it is religious minorities, whether it is persons with mental illnesses, and that is why it's important that when we speak about communities like persons with disability, people with mental illnesses or religious minorities, they need to show uh, solidarity with each other, learn from each other and fight together. But problem is, uh, you know, and I often ask this, who represents the trans community in India? You know, there, there is a conflict of representation over here. Is it, for example, people who are in the National Council for Transgender Persons, are they my representatives? Are the NGOs who are working for the trans rights my representatives? Because if we talk about these two sets of representatives, one is someone, you know, which is, uh, a, which are yes men for the government. Um, when it comes to the NGOs, many of them are threatened by the FCRA rules and, you know, threats to their registration and therefore they also want to be on the right side of what the government says. So then who represents you? And there is this lack of unionization within the trans community. And as I also mentioned, trans community is not one block. So when it comes to persons from the killer community or trans men, they're often not talking to each other forget about trans men talking to persons with mental illnesses to learn from the Mental Health Act and, you know, take those lessons further. So there, there is that. Also, what I see in today's India is there is this poverty of empathy, as I call it. So I may be very much, you know, empathetic towards the cause of the trans person, but I don't care if some Zubair, you know, is arrested for fact-checking. I don't care if uh, Stan Swami, uh, you know, has been put into jail and not given a sipper. I don't care about what happens to the Kashmiri pundits. So it's it's like, uh, and this divisions which are present in the society are used by the government, you know, so that um, now the government, when it comes after the trans persons, everyone else is silent. When it goes after the persons from Northeast, everyone else is silent. So there is no, uh, you know, solidarity amongst these various um, groups which is present. And that's the advantage which is taken by the state in systematic operation of these uh, communities. Also, one has to understand that recently there is this campaign of rainbow nationalism, um, you know, where, where a certain set of um, cis gay men, especially, uh, have shown a lot of allegiance to the state and are uh, pushing the uh, you know Hindu queer movement, which completely negates the movements by the religious minorities, by tribal communities, 
uh, by people from the northeast, for example. And uh, you know, these are this is used to highlight on one side that how progressive India is when it comes to trans rights. At the same time, you know, slyly the government is pushing certain laws, for example, the Artificial Reproductive Techniques Act, the Surrogacy Act, um, um, you know, which systematically take away the rights of the queer and single persons. And no one even talks about it. No one even knows what has happened, you know, to talk about it. So that's a very dangerous uh, phenomenon which is currently, um, you know, underway. So yes, I, I would like to reiterate that there is a need for solidarity amongst the marginalized communities for them to learn from each other. When it comes to my own work, for example, with the trans community, I often use the template of disability community rights. You know, how they, for example, have fought the medicalization of the disability community, how there has been a greater inclusion of persons within the ambit of those 21 categories of disabilities, how reservation and affirmative action is being secured, which is not given to trans communities. So there are these excellent examples from the fights of the other marginalized communities that the trans and queer communities can learn from. Thank you, Anksha. Yes, uh, uh, you know, like uh, when it comes to this sort of pink washing, India is not the first country to go through it, but definitely won't be the last because this sort of homo nationalism or rainbow nationalism uh, is something that we've seen a phenomena of in order to also divert the attention away from much larger burning issues, which are making like, you know, are, uh, really uh, shaking up the base of the fabric uh, of our countries. Uh, uh, but uh, Bishwa, uh, I remember you uh, were very much involved in the days of the coalition building process in Sati. Uh, and uh, could you share some uh, experiences from that as to how the intersection between the different communities that were coming together, especially in places like Orissa, which have had Orisha, uh, which have had a very strong uh, uh, caste-based identity groups. Um, uh, so could you please share something about that? So, uh, yeah, so this coalition building process in Odisha and West Bengal as part of Sati's work in, started in 2008. So um, we started working on a joint advocacy project. So that time uh, it was for uh, PLHIV networks. So, and the, you know, organizations, those who are working with HIV positive networks and then uh, HIV infected and affected people. And also with CSOs and CVOs, those who are working on gender and sexual minorities. So we brought together HIV positive networks and uh, community-based organizations, and also few civil society organizations, those who are working on diverse issues and that were somewhere or the other related to gender and sexuality is few people who are working with you know um, uh, 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 child protection issues few cso's those are working on caste and you know other things so it was a very good experience of bringing them together and to discuss on broader sexual and reproductive health and rights so and how each one of us can contribute to that agenda okay and uh, and uh, also on working on how we can reach out to communities, how we can reach out to parents, how we can build, uh, you know, how we can draw experience from our own uh, this thing work and then how we can contribute to each other's works. So that was, so we continued that and we learned so many uh, things from there. So, um, so it was, there was a need for, you know, uh, joint advocacy meaning, uh, when you were reaching out to government, then instead of, you know, you go and, you know, speak with uh, government people for certain things. And then I again go with some agenda. So it's better if we can come together. And I definitely, uh, what Dr. Aksa and earlier the speaker was talking about, it's very important to, uh, you know, come to a point of convergence and we work together. But also what I learned is that it's very important when we work in a coalition based approach is uh, or when we are you know nav navigating our ways with government is that we need to focus on that um, you know right waste approach somehow somewhere that approach is missing 
so it's just like formulation a policy and we are just focusing on a welfare based approach so the trans act is being you know enacted and there some laws and some policies is being formulated and then we are just in a you know uh, rush to you know deliver those deliverables that's all so somewhere those right based approach is missing and the uh, whoever is working the cvos the cso's whoever is working the activists need to come together it's high time that we need to revisit our agenda what we had thought of a decade back and where we are now though there are very progressive laws and policies though there are you know notification from uh, national medical commission there are uh, you know uh, madras high court judgment there are different laws and policies in the field of education but we really need to revisit why those are not working so those discussions are needed and we we need to start those yeah uh, thank you so much, Bishwa. Uh, before I carry on asking anything, I would like to let everyone know the floor is open for questions. We have about 15 to 20 minutes left on the call. We might be able to extend by a few minutes if the speakers are willing. Uh, but uh, so please feel free to uh, type in the chat box and I will uh, pass the questions on. Um, but you know uh, this entire thing about revisiting our agendas uh, like yes of course uh, uh, sometimes you know like there is a tendency of trying to rest on the laurels that we've already got the, of these so-called progressive legal setups that have come about or uh, the kind of uh, moves taken by governments but how do you push forth with a rights-based approach versus a welfare-based approach in a situation where many people are heavily dependent on that welfare-based approach for getting uh, their uh, foot into the door. And this is a question that I'm opening up for everyone, like uh, all the speakers on the panel. Uh, whoever wants to answer, please just put your hand up and unmute yourself and uh, carry on. How do you how do you create that shift? It is so easy to, for us to say this because of course, like, you know, we are all preaching to the choir here, right? So we are the ones who are like trying to push forward with that, but how do we create that ground level wave? Biswa, please carry on. So the, uh, yeah, I'm sure the other speakers will add to it, but one thing that I realize is whenever we are formulating anything that has to be very consultative. So in many of the cases, what we are seeing is that it's not very consultative. So there are certain things and uh, the government is, you know, just formulating, you know, uh, so uh, the schemes and other things. So there has to be the consultations with community groups, with diverse group is needed. So that is one thing that comes to my mind. Would anyone like to add to that? Deet, have you noticed like a greater deal of uh, consultation of the intersex individuals when it comes to uh, uh, creating rights-based approaches? Yes, uh, I think first of all, you know, when starting a uh, any policy or you know when initiating any policies and all i think the concerned government needs to take utmost initiative let's say for example we have the uzala scheme by the uh, pradhan mantri uzala scheme uh, because of this uh, now this this scheme is almost you know 80 to 90 percent successful because in, in every household there is you know uh, one person is registered for cooking cylinders and all. But why this is possible is because the government itself is taking initiative to you know implement the schemes. If in the same way the government has taken initiative to you know uh, make this transgender act or you know any new policies regarding uh, any uh, marginalized community when they initiate any uh, policies or uh, if when they frame a law or rights in the country i think first and foremost the concerned government the concerned authority needs to take initiative in 
sensitizing and giving awareness about the uh, rules, about the policies, and not just depending on the NGOs, you know, and the CPOs to come to their office and approach them to give, to conduct an awareness program and so on. I think Biswa will know that, you know, in Manipur, uh, Sati is uh, doing uh, its utmost, you know, in capability to sensitize the transgender community, you know, even they, in their office, they have this uh, legal ad cleaning, which is uh, most dedicated to the transgender community. And it came from the transgender, from the NASA judgment and from the transgender act 2019. So I think not only waiting for the NGOs and CBOs to approach uh, the concern authority regarding uh, sensitization of the marginalized community, I think the concern authority and the state government or the central government should take the initiative in giving awareness and advocating like the way they did in various schemes which they have their target uh, goals. So the same way I think we need to do for the marginalized community also. Thank you, Deet. Uh, Pavan's asking a question uh, on whether Saptashi and Suraj have any suggestions on leveraging Johar, which was also something that was playing on my mind for a bit. Like, is it possible to create? A, because Saptashi has mentioned that you, like, you know, you've used that framework previously and you think about it a lot. Uh, so, Saptashi and Suraj, uh, would you like to comment on that? I think Suraj had his hand up, so maybe he can go first and then. Sure. Okay. Um, so, I'll illustrate uh, by one or two examples the importance of uh, speaking to engaging with other social movements uh, as a litigating lawyer as well. Um, so, we worked on the constitutional challenge for the adultery uh, law as well. And something that we uh, encountered um, at, from a group of lawyers who were not necessarily sensitive or uh, actively engaging with women's rights movements is this sort of dangerous argument that emerged, but fortunately did not end up coming before the courts, which is, so what the, what the law on adultery did was, to criminalize uh, the the married woman's relationship with uh, a man outside of marriage, right? But uh, leaving the married man uh, wholly exempted. And the way it materialized is that the person, the man outside the marriage is uh, punishable by imprisonment. So the woman herself does not face any penal, um, you know, uh, punishment but it's the man ultimately who goes to prison. And this sort of dangerous argument that emerged, uh, because you would, you would imagine that uh, in, a, in a constitutional adjudication relating to law and adultery, you would have an opportunity to build progressive jurisprudence on equality, non-discrimination on basis of gender, like, and gender automatically, presumably being uh, women's rights. But this sort of argument that started emerging amongst a group of lawyers is that, you know, it's because ultimately the man goes to prison. So we should be arguing that the law on adultery is discriminatory on basis of gender of the man. And we thought that it was quite a, a bad example to take ahead before courts because uh, in the kind of political environment you live in also, you don't want to amplify those voices that can automatically piggyback on that and take it to unintended consequences. Um, so, and, you know, then you had to engage with those other lawyers and suggest that, you know, it's adequate. You have enough ammunition to uh, argue that the laws discriminatory on basis of gender for the women. And in looking at the uh, drafting history and implementation of the law, um, the second thing I'd say is, uh, you know, the, the question about uh, reconciling uh, the rights-based framework with uh, welfare state. 
this is something we also encountered while the transgender act was being drafted and one of the challenges that came before uh, civil society folks themselves is to reconcile self determination with access to uh, social welfare programs uh, and the sort of argument that was emerging from uh, some hijra groups was that because uh, hijra groups are most marginalized amongst the trans community as well and they want to ensure that um, the right beneficiary uh, benefits from the targeted programs that a certain screening procedure would not be such a bad thing to be permitted under the law and then you had to have several rounds of consultations with civil society uh, uh, folks from the queer and trans movements to to say that that the rights based framework is not antithetical to a welfare uh, state program and you can have self determination based on self declaration and uh, have that as adequate proof to access social welfare programs as well so i think it's a matter of pushing forward and <laughs> doing the work to uh, speak to different people and getting people together thanks suraj over to you satishi all right so i wanted to repeat uh, i wanted to say the same thing that suraj uh, ended his comments with that i don't think that the rights based framework is necessarily in conflict with a welfare uh, uh, you know kind of framework uh, narega will be the again uh, I'll, i'll keep going back to that uh, uh, as an example of, uh, of of a rights based legislation uh, which which also incorporates sort of welfare and and participation of the uh, communities and so on and so forth okay uh, speaking of uh, johar i am uh, very skeptical about johar the whole judicial sort of you know uh, milk of kindness thing and also the entire campaign that led to it uh, it was an entire it was an entirely elite campaign it just ended uh, in uh, giving us rainbow lapel pins right whereas uh, the issue was such that it should have led to restructuring of the entire criminal justice system um right uh, however I, and I, this is a question that i've been thinking about since the last i mean when it, since johar came out that what what really happened i mean in what specific way was it useful uh so if you look at the the use of johar in the last couple of years the way johar is being used by other courts you see that johar is being cited in all these judgments in the all, all these high court judgments where the high court is sort of uh, uh, sort of giving protection to to couples to queer couples right but again uh, that's not a new thing and that was happening pre johar that was happening pre naz also i mean suraj might be familiar with some of this history because Uh, i mean my former colleagues at lawyers collective would go and uh, get these uh, uh, get such orders from the court even before now right so so then did johar really change anything in these cases um maybe johar made it more legitimate to talk about certain issues that were not considered uh, that weren't openly talked about earlier within the legal system right so so even as a symbolic tool johar has had some sort of um sort of you know uh, sort of uh, effect uh, however johar also talks about in uh, sort of uh, anti discrimination and it it introduces this idea of in indirect discrimination it talks about johar can be used to obtain a whole lot of other rights for queer communities also but that route seems to be kind of that that seems to be in a shaky sort of state right now with the current government which is which is making which has made it stand very clear that johar is sort of limited to anti is is limited to decriminalization and those uh, anti discrimination pronouncements uh, 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 cannot be given any legal effect so that that's as far as the symbolic relevance of johar and its limitations is concerned in terms of material relevance of johar i i don't know um one example that comes to my mind uh, uh, i mean one example of 
the of a material sort of significance of of Johar seems to be um, the uh, the the gay adult uh, entertainers, uh, right? Uh, they're they're posting clips on uh, uh, Twitter and uh, everywhere, and and uh, pre Johar they would have been like direct uh, sort of uh, evidence. Of carnal intercourse against you know, in the nature. Now they are immunized from prosecution uh, because of Johar. But apart from that, I'm not very sure if uh, trans people who are facing harassment from the police before, if Johar has really sort of changed their experiences now. So uh, I, 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 I would love to hear from people with greater connection, uh, uh, with, with greater, who are in greater touch with uh, 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 communities and, and the ground reality. I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Suraj and Saptashi. Uh, yes, like uh, uh, sometimes, you know, um, uh, for instance, I, this has already come up in conversation earlier, how the NASA judgment was a much more powerful judgment, but it was watered down in the act. And then we, of course, have Joel, which could easily be used for so much more. But it essentially is that label of decriminalization, which is doubted by the government, and it is seldom used for anything more. Um, uh, but uh, yes, there seems to be... Okay. Uh, Aksa, you've raised your hand. Aksa, you wanted to add to that? Uh, no, no, please, uh, please, then I'll come back. Okay. I um, want to so speak like, on uh, rights-based approach. Right. Uh, uh, so there, there seems to be a massive lag in the way the government approaches a lot of the legal decisions in the first place. And there has been a reluctance to actually flesh them out properly because it doesn't suit uh, perhaps the larger coterie of voters who seem to be supporting uh, the, uh, the government in power. Uh, in this situation, perhaps like it becomes very difficult to quantify how much change it is actually making uh, when it comes to um, sorry, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, like a decision like Johar being used at the ground level, say in a police station when it comes to harassment of a queer person, irrespective of which group the person belongs to. Um, so, uh, Akshay, you wanted to add to that. Yeah, so um, I wanted to uh, you know, add to what um, this one mentioned with reference to the rights-based approach versus the welfare um, state kind of approach um, in reference to the trans persons. Um, you know, if you look at the Trans Act um, with all its provisions, how have things changed on the ground? It's going to be two years in September 2022 since the notification of the trans rules. And that two years was the time given to the various state governments um, for implementing the provisions of the act, for example, gender neutral toilets or separate, uh, you know, wards for trans persons in hospitals. Um, and our um, RTI responses that we have been getting suggest that even in places like Delhi, we do not have, uh, you know, sometimes even one trans toilet in one district, you know, so the law, even if it looks um, great on paper, when it comes to on-ground implementation, there is hard gain. If you look at the, um, you know, the complaints under the Trans Act, which talks about the physical, sexual, emotional abuse of trans persons, uh, the crime records shows that there has been only one complaint. Does that mean that in a population of, you know, millions of trans persons, only one person has been abused? So there is, uh, you know, no utilization or implementation of the transact on the ground. That's one. Secondly, what is being implemented or what is being projected as being implemented through the SMILE scheme of the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment is one the trans card. And that is acting more like a licensing agency, you know. Um, second is the scholarship scheme which they have just launched, uh, which says that it's for children and how is a trans child going to apply for a trans card unless their parents apply? And how many parents would 
say that my child is a trans child, you know, and I want a card for that. So it's very impractical. And you are giving them 1000 rupees per month for pursuing their education. I'm sure no trans person went and told them that if you give me 1000, then that will change my life as a trans student. And then next what? Next is a series of Garima Grace, which are which have started mushrooming. And I really thank Santan, who's also in the audience right now, you know, for enlightening uh, us on how these Garima Grace are actually surveillance and disciplinary centers, um, you know, which are like um, uh, the which is what we are following, like the juvenile justice system, you know, where children come into these reform homes and all. Uh, but what is being missed out? is the affirmative action in the spaces of education and in the spaces of employment. Um, if you need to, we need to understand that, you know, the visibilization of the trans community is mostly by the hijra and the kinder community, but the non hijra kinder community population is now becoming more visible. These are young folks who are staying with their families. The problem they are facing is the bullying in the schools. The problem they are facing are changing their names and genders in the academic transcripts. The problems that they're facing are the lack of mental health services provided by the state. Um, the problems that they are facing is employment. There's no reservation, you know, and if you have to get recruitment, you have to go to the court to get all this. But the, the trans act does not do anything about it. So, yes, I do understand that while, you know, that welfare approach of giving a scholarship, making these homes and all is fine, the community should not lose its vision and should not stop demanding on affirmative action in education and employment, which was promised under the non Thank you so much, Aksa. Yes, uh, it is very important to remember not to fall for the SOPs that are constantly given out by the government and just stop there because you know it is so important to uh, hold them accountable for the rights that are not met and uh, uh, not just you know like make do with the little drips that come through um with that uh, i would like to invite final comments we are at the end of the hour we actually four minutes above it um so i would re uh, like to uh, ask uh, uh, bishwa if you have any final comments and then deet and then carry on uh, no there will be nothing from my end thank you Thank you, Bishwa. Did do you have any final comments? Uh, no, I think. Thank you. Okay, should I just group Suraj and Saptashi together? <laughs> no, uh, that wouldn't be fair. Saptashi, you go first. No such final comments. So, okay. Suraj. Um, I'll just say that, I mean, like everybody is echoed and rightfully that more than the Transgender Act, it's NALSA that gave a lot more hope and uh, actual progress on the ground for many people. And that shows in the kind of work that has happened before courts and uh, local state governments. So as a lawyer, I'm more excited about the, the directions in which NALSA and Johar's uh, anti-discrimination uh, orders can be taken ahead, whether it's uh, employment, uh, housing, or legal recognition. It's the kind of substantive jurisprudence that emerges from uh, these courts that I feel uh, have more uh, potential. And thank you, Suraj. Um... You know, like, I think it's very interesting that if you look at the gamut of things that we covered today and in such a short span of time, we have spoken about how, uh, you know, the, the aspect of, you know, rights versus welfare and rights and welfare. We've spoken about, you know, like, uh, as Aksa just mentioned, you know, Garima Gray has been a site of surveillance and discipline, very similar to uh, other detention centers. But, uh, you know, like, uh, I can't help but feel that uh, there has to be a more coerced effort on our part as well to not 
uh, uh, sit down on our laurels and uh, just uh, assume things will flow yeah, automatically, you know, and we have a dreadful tendency of getting stuck uh, uh, in our ivory towers and assuming that, uh, uh, say, like as Suraj mentioned, you know, the anti-discrimination is something that is happening already just because the legal decisions are there and because some of us in this virtual room are not discriminated against on a regular basis um with that i think uh, uh pavan would you like to add some final comments uh since uh of course like you've been involved in so many parts of these movements um and then with that we can wrap up Uh, I just want to thank all the speakers. Uh, I'm actually not in a place where I can uh, say much at length anyways, uh, but just that it's been uh, fantastic hearing all of you. Thank you so much for making time and uh, a big thanks to my colleagues, Dev Jyoti and Orkhodidra also for having persisted with all the webinars that have taken place so far. I just hope that we will have uh, more opportunities to discuss some of the points that came up today. And uh, uh, we will also, uh, we would actually love to uh, elaborate on many of these issues that came up today on the pages of Varta Webzine. So I promise to chase all the speakers for articles and write-ups. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pavan. Yes, thank you so much, all of you. It has been really wonderful and it has given so much food for thought. And especially because so many things have come up uh, during such a short period of time and we've covered different aspects, things that I didn't expect to actually get into, but yes, that it seemed more like uh, an intense casual conversation versus a very structured one, but it uh, bore more fruit than I expected. Uh, thanks so much, all of you for your valuable time and I'm looking forward to carrying this discussion on further. Uh, take care and uh, hope to see you all in person quite soon instead of making it all virtual and uh, looking forward to a more fruitful collaboration in the future take care all of you bye for now thank you thank you for your sunday